In this video, I'm gonna be opening up my Facebook message request box and answering every freaking question I can find. Some of them are interesting and some of them are bad crazy. If you hang out in any of the SEO Facebook groups, then you're likely getting some random DMs from other SEOs. And after you filter through the hundreds that start with, dear sir, I'm selling links, you'll end up with a lot of genuine people that genuinely need some help with their SEO. So that's what I'm here to do. I'm gonna answer a bunch of these questions and help these folks out here right now. Now before I get started, if you applaud my effort, let me know by contributing to the Like Button Foundation. Every day, over 2 million like buttons go unpressed, and you can take the first step towards ending this plague today. Thank you so, so much. Let's get started. But please bear in mind that I've taken the liberty to rewrite a lot of these questions and fix the grammar. The first one is from Ebod. I pay for sponsored posts on top authority sites to rank product review keywords. Now a competitor does the same thing, and since his post is more fresh, Google is ranking his instead of mine. What can I do? Okay, so what Ebod is talking about is Parasite SEO, where people are piggybacking off the authority of an existing website that has a bunch of links, has a bunch of existing authority, and then leveraging that authority so they can rank their own articles that are on those websites. A lot of people are noticing this these days because in a lot of affiliate niches, they're seeing at the top results sites like AP News or Medium ranked high. And we all know that AP News and Medium aren't necessarily niche experts in protein powders or whatever that might be, but people are leveraging it anyways and getting away with it. It's just a simple state of the Google algorithm right now because Google's highly favoring authority right now. And yeah, it's effective. Now, Ibad, the issue that you're seeing right now is because of keyword cannibalization. Google just generally doesn't like to rank the same website for the same keywords. So for example, if you're trying to rank for Wartrol Review, which is a wart removing supplement, you would go to medium.com and perhaps create an author profile or go to AP News and pay for a sponsored post get it up there, but in your situation, someone new is coming along and they take over the rankings because Google doesn't want to rank two articles for the exact same keyword. Now, to fix keyword cannibalization, typically what you would do is, it usually occurs on your own website. So if you own the website, then we can just see, okay, we have two pages competing for the same keyword. I'm gonna de-optimize this page, which I don't wanna rank, and I'm just gonna make sure this one is nicely optimized. You can also make sure that you're not sending any anchor text to with Wartrol review to this page that we don't wanna rank and confusing Google in any way thinking that this is the one that should be ranked for that keyword. You wanna keep all the optimization, including the words on the page, the meta title, the description, all that stuff reserved for the intended page you wanna rank. But this isn't your situation. You have AP News, you're on AP News or whatever, and both of you guys are gunning and optimizing for the same keyword word trial review. So the only thing we have left here in our toolbox is backlinks. Now, Google will decide which page to rank on a given website by number of factors optimization, but if you're all, both neck and neck in the optimization game, it comes down to authority. So what you can do is send a bunch of backlinks to this page and hope that Google will recognize, okay, this is the page with more authority, more links, let's rank this one instead. Now, what kind of links to build in Parasite SEO? Typically, people aren't building the best links on the planet to these pages on sites that aren't their own property. So, a lot of people are doing single payment PBNs or something like that. Maybe a guest post camp campaign, maybe a skyscraper outreach campaign because they're typically a low amount of involvement and a low amount of payment, sometimes no payment. But these are both options that you'd probably want to explore. I don't think freshness is so much of a factor. I mean, Google has freshness as part of the algorithm, but I don't think just because your competitor's page is new, that's why they're, they're ranking. It could be optimization. Maybe they're more optimized than you. And also authority can help cement you back into the rankings. Hope that helps. The next one's from Anasa. I'm looking for a friend that is missing. His name is Jermaine. Do you know him? And have you heard from him today? Are you serious? Are you serious? I told you there are some strange ones, but I definitely don't know a Jermaine and I definitely don't know any missing Jermaines. I really hope you find your friend. And if you guys think I was making up this one, here's your screenshot. Dima asks, at what point did you decide to go all in on something? I have a full-time job and my side income can't replace it. Okay, so this one hits close to my heart because I was in the exact same position as an engineer back in California, making some good money, six figures a year, getting my engineering salary, and even though I was completely destroyed and wrecked and overworked and completely stressed out by that job, it's still a common sense thing to want to look out for your future and subscribe to this notion that it's all about work now, enjoy it later type thing. 
And when you're getting a monthly paycheck, it's coming in regularly, it's really hard to detach from that and take a risk on entrepreneurship in general. I'd feel really irresponsible if I just went straight out and said, hey guys, uh, SEO is, is gonna work for everybody, you should just quit what you're doing, jump right into it, and everything's gonna be fine. It, it's not like that for everybody, that's for sure. And even in my own experience, I'm very conservative when it comes to taking risks. And in my situation, I, had to get to a certain point. So I had to, uh, like, let's say for example, for sake of argument, that in my engineering job I was making $100,000 a year, so let's say about $10,000 a month or whatever. When I got my affiliate stuff getting to be about $3,000 a month, then I thought, okay, well, at least if I move to another country where expenses aren't so high, no matter what, I can still survive. So I went ahead and did that. But I also did this calculation that you might find useful and Basically what you can do is you calculate your savings, your net worth, and you look at the worst case situation. If you never figured things out, if you never made any more than you're making right now, if you never, never made a single penny, when would you run out of money in a place like Thailand or in a place like Costa Rica or something like that? So, so you knew, okay, well, if I'm frugal and I'm doing the right things, but I just never figure out how to make any money, I'll run out when I'm 63. But I do definitely think it's good to frame things in such a way that you can see the absolute worst side of things. Now that we've talked about that, I do want to get on the optimistic side of things as well because I truly believe looking back that every year that I stayed in the engineering job and didn't take the risk, that so much of my journey, so much of my entrepreneurial start and real my real growth in life was delayed because of that. And I, I used to be afraid that I would never be able to hit my engineering salary ever again, you know, like $10,000 a month. How could I ever do that doing this online thing where people read reviews and click things? Things, like how can that actually work out but it's very possible for people to make more in a month and sometimes even more in a week than they did in an entire year of a career so there's that too I don't want to make decisions for you this is a big decision it's not just about your career but it's about your entire life and your personal journey but I wish you the best but I think the, the best thing you can do is just frame things and whenever you feel comfortable go ahead the next one is from Shycott. What is your take on affiliate sites that only target money keywords and were not hit by December's core algorithm update? Is it safe to build affiliate sites only with money keywords? Okay, so if you guys are watching and you don't know what he's talking about with the December core algorithm update, my analysis of it, I'll leave a link to my analysis video in the description, so check that out. But basically, in a nutshell, what I found by doing some correlation study is the higher percentage of money content reviewing keywords with the words best or review in the title, the higher percentage you had of that on your website, the more likely the chance that you had a decrease in traffic since the update. And we analyzed over 600 sites and we plotted a scatter plot and we saw the trend line. If you saw examples that do not fit this mold, I have three answers for this. Number one is it could just be a brand new site. Brand new sites tend to get away with a lot of different stuff. It's, it's almost like they're not yet on Google's radar yet and a lot of the filters just don't apply yet. I, I'm not really sure what it is. Number two is that there's just multiple things going on in an update. It's never just about one thing. So even though that's a theory that I have that's somewhat supported by data, doesn't necessarily mean that's the only thing going on. So a site that went up could possibly had so much good stuff going on with it that the negative impact from this thing didn't affect them. And number three is I'll openly admit it's quite possible that my theory is just not true. There's always correlation versus causation type issues that could come up. It could just be a non-factor. So we always have to take theories with a grain of salt. Even though I stand by it and I'm changing my entire process to focus on informational content for now until I see how Google reacts in the next update, doesn't mean that it's a truth, it's an axiom. So we have to take that into consideration. Now, for the second part of your question, is it safe to build affiliate sites with only money keywords? I mean, I wouldn't do it. I'm not doing it right now. I think that it, in one day and age, it was possible to do this, but based on the current data, I do not think that that's a wise move. And they could roll back this requirement. They could, again, it just may not exist, but they could roll it back, and in which case we can have a, a higher proportion than we can currently right now, but we have to wait and see. Now Joshua says, first, about three years ago, we spoke about how you stay looking like you're 20. Any updates to that? Follow-up question, where is the Fountain of Youth located? 
All right, first of all, Joshua, thank you very much. I don't know if I necessarily agree that I look 20, definitely not. I'm 42 at the time of this recording and maybe I look a little bit younger than 40, but on the inside, I definitely don't feel that way. If this is a serious question, I honestly think it has a lot to do with genetics. I'm half Japanese, so that's probably a lot to do with it. When I was in high school, I always looked a lot younger than my age was. When I was 21, I can finally go to bars. I looked like I was 15. So you can imagine it definitely wasn't all upside. But there are indeed some, some practices that I do that might be helping. Uh, first is every single day, no matter if I'm going in the sun or not, wear sunblock. Number two, drink a crap ton of water, 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 water. Uh, so basically what I would do is just Google and see probably there's a Healthline article or something like that and see what's your body weight, what's your amount of physical activity and what's the amount of water you should be drinking appropriately. So water's really gonna help. And beyond that, getting physical exercise. So I, I go to the gym when I was uh, dancing a lot. I used to be a street dancer. I used to like to dance popping, but crazy anomaly that you see in, in the dance scene, especially the popping scene, is that there's a lot of OGs, this is what we call the original generation, that are approaching 50, 60 years old, and they don't look it at all. They look like they're in their, their 30s, maybe 40s. And I think it's just the amount of, perhaps it's just doing what you love, but also the amount of physical activity that's keeping them look young. AJ asks, have you ever considered PR as a way to get backlinks? Absolutely. So I'm assuming you're talking about digital PR and if you guys are watching and you don't know what digital PR is, is basically what you're doing is you're creating a story, a big share worthy story, a link worthy story. So maybe you're publishing a statistics piece on how COVID has affected marital relationships or something like that. So you get a study made, you put it up on your website, you decorate the crap out of it, and then you pitch it to a bunch of journalists on major online news sources, like you're trying to get on the Washington Post, SF Gate, so all the big New York Times, that level type site. And it's been a big, big focus on my link building for the last year or so. So the thing with digital PR is it's not very consistent. You can't do it every time. It's, it's about timing. It's about thinking of the right story. It's about getting it in front of the right journalist. But when it hits, when it gets viral, you're talking hundreds, 200, sometimes 300 links and all from really, really nice websites. Because once it's published on New York Times, then other people cover it as well and it just gets shared and shared and shared. Now, if you want to see an example of this, if you go to diggitymarketing.com, I, I don't know if it's easily navigatable to, but so if you Google diggity marketing and most find businesses, then you'll see a piece that we created, gathered a whole bunch of statistics and doing a digital PR outreach campaign right now. So depending on when you watch this video, you'll see how this one performed. All right, Sergey asked, what are your top three business books? I'm gonna lay these out in order of when I think you should read them in your entrepreneurial journey from, I'm just thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, I'm on the way, and then I'm quite mature in it. So the first one I'd recommend is called End of Jobs by Taylor Pearson. And what's so great about this book is it uses a lot of data and statistics to show that being in a job and working for other people is actually quite risky and the way the world is moving to being more digital, more remote and more automated, especially with AI and stuff like that, it's actually becoming very, very risky to hold any type of job. And we're talking about everything from pilots to, to doctors and everything under the sun is at risk. And he also makes another great thesis around in this day and age, the main skill that you need to be having isn't your education, isn't the degree that you have, isn't the amount of work that you can produce, but it's your entrepreneurialness, if that's actually a real word, and your ability to put teams together and solve new problems and see how different solutions can fit together to make something new for the world. So that's a real value that people are gonna be needing in a future where AI is doing a lot of the real work and we're still gonna need entrepreneurs to put it all together. And the best thing about this book is because if you're in the beginning of your entrepreneurial phase, then it's gonna light a fire under your butt to get moving. My second favorite business book is The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. And it's been a long time since I read this book, but what I really liked about it is it shows the importance of having processes and systems. So being able to document down exactly what are the steps to fulfill and complete a certain task or a project or whatever that might be. So while it's you doing the task in the first place, Place, it's never going to be you again. It's going to be someone that you're hiring to do it and someone who's going to take over and own that process instead of you. What that enables you to do is scale, scale, scale. 
And the third book that I'm gonna recommend is Who? The A Method for Hiring by Jeff Smart. Who is really, really good because once you're set up, once you're an entrepreneur, once you're doing things and you got business running and stuff like that, there's only really two tasks that you should be focused on. One is management, and so to making sure the people that are reporting to you are doing the things that you want them to do. They're achieving new things, they're improving processes, they're innovating on their own, so that's very, very important. But the second thing that you need to be doing is hiring. So who are the people that you're putting into these positions. So for me, myself, I would say I have a below average EQ, so emotional intelligence. I mean, I'm in, I'm in touch with my emotions, I get it. Like I know anger, I know all that stuff, but I, what I mean by that is I'm not that good at reading people uh, as opposed to someone who has a high EQ. And so before, when I would conduct interviews, I pretty much just liked everybody because you know, everyone's putting on their best face in the interview. The resume is just completely crafted to be absolutely perfect. And I buy into it because I, I generally can't see flaws that well. So what who the A method for hiring does is it gives you a blueprint. Here's the questions you need to ask and at what stage, and here's how to interpret that. So a person like me, or anyone for that matter, doesn't have any confusion on whether or not this person is an A player. So that, that's another thing about this book. It's focused on hiring only A players. These are people that are gonna take your business from one place to the next. Good book, check it out. And Sergey had a second question. Why aren't you trying to build a mega brand like NerdWallet? My answer, who says I'm not? The thing is, I'm just normally not publicly announcing every single business that I have, mainly because not all of them would benefit about a public figure and what they're associated with and anything that could come along with that. But it's definitely something I'm doing. Richard asks, I was wondering if you could give me some information regarding your Affiliate Lab course. Does the course give you more information on SEO in general or is it all based on affiliate marketing? So what I would say about this is the Affiliate Lab does give you all the tools to do all the SEO that you need to rank affiliate websites. It's definitely focused on affiliate websites and we get into a lot of stuff beyond the SEO, like how to do conversion rate optimization, how to do email marketing, how to negotiate with your affiliate managers, a whole bunch of affiliate specific stuff. But in terms of the foundation, yes, it gives you everything you need in your SEO toolkit. But what it doesn't cover is local SEO. So we're not gonna get into how to rank on the map pack just because it's an affiliate SEO focused course. So if you do want to do local SEO, you probably wanna supplement with some knowledge some, somewhere else, watch some YouTube videos or something like that in order to get your local SEO knowledge. That said, we have a whole bunch of local SEOs in the course and they say they learned a lot. Asja says, hi, hi. Dave asks, I saw you suggest in the affiliate lab that you recommend pages over posts, but what if I've already set things up as posts? Do I need to switch over? So what Dave's referring to is, that's yeah, true, in the affiliate lab, I typically recommend, if I had to give a recommendation, that you should make your affiliate content with pages versus posts. I'm talking about your money, keywords, and stuff like that. And the reason because of this is because you have a little bit more control over pages and making category level pages. So if I had domainname.com and I wanted to have a category called best supplements, right? And I could rank this page for best supplements. I can also make another directory underneath it called protein powder, so best protein powder supplements, and you have a lot of control. When you have posts, for example, if you make a category, it's not a formatable page. It's a, a blog feed. It's just every single categorized post is just gonna come up there like a blog feed, and you don't really get the chance to format it. Now, there's plugins that let you override how the post looks, so you can definitely just work around that, but it's just something that I recommended. If you don't wanna dig into plugins, if you just want an easier structure to work with, that's why I just recommend pages. That said, it's not a deal breaker. Like I just said, if you already have posts and you want to do something like this, maybe maybe you don't even care about that. Maybe you don't even care about creating a hierarchy. Then it doesn't matter for you. But if you wanted to make this hierarchy, you can just use that plugin and, without having to switch over to pages. It's going to be a pain in your butt if you switch over to pages. Chris says, I had a bit of a nightmare today with a Google update. My first affiliate site, if you have the chance in the coming days, could I ask you to run your eye over it? Chris, really sorry to hear that. Always sucks, especially with your first affiliate site, but everyone goes through it. At least you're getting your lesson over early. In terms of reviewing the site, why don't you go ahead and, if you're okay with it, leaving it in the comments below. I often review sites in this YouTube channel. I have a playlist, live websites audit. So if you guys haven't checked that out, I've reviewed a whole bunch of websites, including Gear Hungry. Definitely check that out. So if you want to have your website considered for a review, just leave it down in the comment section and I'll get to it when I can get to it. There's a fairly long queue already. Sorry about that.
Adrian asks, does link building work for languages outside English? How about receiving links to a foreign site from an English site? To answer the first part of your question, yes, link building definitely works for foreign websites. Think of it like this, like whatever's happening in foreign SERPs, this is what was happening in the English SERPs like maybe a year before. So it's always been the progression that over time, Google is going to try to incorporate more factors other than links into its main algorithm. We're a little bit more progressed around that timeline for English. English websites. So think like we went back in time one year for foreign SERP. So links matter even more. So definitely it works in foreign SEO. The second part of your question, so if you have a foreign website, if you're getting a link from an English website, does that work? And yeah, we actually single variable tested this a lot at Authority Builder. So we have a lot of clients that are in the Australian space and everyone has this concern, like I've only should I only be getting links from Australia? And we ran a lot of single variable tests and we showed that you can definitely get ranking increases and traffic increases sending links from English websites. We have to remember at the end of the day, the majority of the internet is English websites. So it's completely okay to receive links from them. Another question from Olaf, what's your take on receiving links from foreign sites to English sites? So this is not something I really worry about. If they come in naturally, I don't care. It's perfectly fine. It's just what happens. Someone liked my content in Spain and they link to me. That's great. But it's not something I'm going to actively seek out. I mean, link building, especially if you're doing outreach, is an effort. So if I'm going to be putting my effort in something, I'm going to be putting my effort into English sites, which I know for sure are going to give me a ranking increase. Zach asks, are you still living in Thailand? I'm thinking about doing in a YOLO and booking a flight there, but I don't know anybody. Would you advise it? Yeah, Zach. So right now I'm in Koh Samui, Thailand, which is an island towards the south. Every day I'm very, very grateful for being here. There's a huge SEO scene. Like right now, even in Samui, there's at least 20 SEOs and we're getting together every day. And we're always surrounded by SEO entrepreneurs. And it's really good to immerse yourself, at least for me. I find that I always want to be around entrepreneurs and have conversations that are about possibility and pushing the limits and you know you're the average of the five people that you're around that that kind of thing right so the second part to your question was I don't know anybody will I be okay is that going to be fine well first off if you're an SEO and you come over we're very very welcoming and opening you can immediately join our community so you're going to have friends instantly right away normally most of the time we're in Chiang Mai which is in the north and that's where we live for 90% of the year so if you come up to Chiang Mai, we're always having meetups all the time. Usually on Thursdays, we have a Facebook group that you can join. It's impossible not to connect with people. But on the other side of things is Thailand is such a friendly country. They call it the land of smiles that you really don't need to know anybody and you're going to have a friend by the end of the day. That's just how friendly people are here. And it even rubs off on the foreigners that visit here too. So it's just a different world. And of course, before you pull a YOLO, I'd highly recommend coming here and traveling just to make sure you like it. Not everyone likes it. So come over and we'll meet you and say what's up. Lucas says, I watched your presentation at Affiliate World 2019 and I have to say it was awesome. If you guys are watching this and you haven't seen this video, you can find it on YouTube. You mentioned the benefits of buying a blog instead of creating one because you skipped the Google sandbox. If we buy a blog, can we change the domain name? So let's say, for example, you bought a blog and you're not crazy about the name, like bestwirelessrouter.com. You're like, that just sounds like terrible, right? I want to change it over to techpros.com, which is brandable and I can scale into other niches and stuff like that. And this is typically performed with a 301 redirect. Now the thing is, and I can say this with conviction, is 301 redirects don't always stick. I got a buddy, he's in the finance niche. He had a site that was making a lot of money. Just we'll put it like that, a lot of money, all right? He wanted to rebrand it into another name. And with all fairness, this new name sounds a lot better, but it just never took hold. It never got to the same amount of traffic that the original site did. So if it's just about rebranding the name, I wouldn't really do it. If it's about trying to avoid some penalty or an absorption of a brand into another brand, then that's a different story. But if it's just about having a nicer name, please don't do it. It's, it's kind of dangerous. Vikram asks, what are your favorite SEO tools? Well, the tool that I use most often is probably Ahrefs. And because it's like the Swiss army knife for SEOs, it's going to look at your backlinks. It's going to do keyword research. It's going to be doing competitor analysis. It does a whole bunch of stuff. The site audits are quite awesome with it too. So Ahrefs is my premier tool that I log into the most. The second tool I use the most is Surfer. So Surfer is what helps me or helps my writers write all their content. So it's analyzing the top competitors in the niche, figuring out what got 
them to those positions in terms of content and optimization and stuff like that. And then I pass over this analysis to my writers. They write within a framework. So they're writing a perfectly optimized piece of content. So Ahrefs and Surfer are the ones that I use all the time. On top of that, I'm using Screaming Frog quite a lot, Scrapebox from time to time, but it's really just Ahrefs and Surfer that I'm probably logging into every single day. Vikram has a second question. How much do you invest in a blog before it starts giving you returns? Bro, that question is so niche specific. It just depends on your timing, how fast you start ranking the niche, how easy the niche is. I, I could give you a very, very wide range. There's Amazon affiliate niches, which you would consider to be low competition because they have low commission, but that's not necessarily the case where I've invested $20,000 only to make $1,000 a month at, at that point. And there's other niches where I've only put in like $500 and they're already starting to make $2,000, $3,000 a month. So there's really, really a huge wide range there's no formula i wish i could give you one but there is none excel says hi please i need a youtube mentor i started a few days ago and i'm discouraged bro i'm not your guy to give you youtube advice i i'm just pretty new to this too i don't really know what i'm doing that well just putting out some content really <laughs> But if you want to know who I follow and who I feel is pretty darn good at getting YouTube advice from, check out Nick Nimmin. So that guy's got a YouTube channel and he's got really good advice. Isaac says, I'd love to hear about your biggest SEO failure and what you did about it. Okay, so my biggest SEO failure was, I don't even know when this was, maybe 2015, 2016 or something like that. The strategy at the time was to use PVNs to send your money anchor text to a website. So if you're backlinking, you know what a PVN is, you use that for your money anchor. So best protein powder, protein powder review, something like that. And then for everything else, all your other links, you use a software like SE Nuke and just hit spam, 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 spam. And I saw it working for one site. Let's just deploy it to the whole profile and then penguin 2.0 came out and just nuked my entire portfolio so all my websites just got absolutely nuked so after that what I what I did about it is I went back to the drawing board and I thought you know that was the stupidest thing I've ever done I know better than this being an, an engineer never to do anything without testing not to do anything without diversifying strategy and stuff like that so I really got me back to my roots as an engineer and I started meticulously testing everything in controlled environments before I start deploying it on all my projects and it's it's got me where I am today. I'm, I'm super happy that it happened. Samara asks, I'd love to join your course. Do you have monthly installments? Absolutely we do. We have a two pay option. Mike asks, what's the best way to check meta on the homepage and make sure everything is set up correctly? Interesting question, Mike. I'm not absolutely sure what you're referring to. When some people talk about meta, they're talking about the meta title, the meta description. Other people might be talking about meta robots where you're doing stuff like saying no index this page. Like definitely don't do that. But in terms of what to do about the title and description, you can check out my on-site SEO guide. I'll put a link to it in the description and learn how to optimize meta title and description. Cody asks, is .com the best choice and are there other TLD options to use instead? I don't really have a concrete answer to this one because I only use .coms, it's just a preference type thing. And the reason I'm making that preference is just because of conversion, right? So I think that people in general trust .com websites more than they do .info or whatever that might be. So I'm picking it based on a conversion standpoint and also brandability and also the flippability. So I'm always selling websites, selling businesses. So I wanna make sure they're, they're highly flippable as well and that it's gonna be appealed to a wider range of buyers right now in terms of what's rankable and what's not as far as I know everyone says that it doesn't matter what your TLD is they're all ranked the same so there's that Thomas asks what do you do in terms of link building the first one to six months of a brand new site really good question Thomas so for a brand new site you're in what's called the Google sandbox phase where you really just want to focus on building trust for the this business for this website so the first links that I build are the links that most real businesses would in the real world and that's social profiles so I would go out and make a Facebook page a YouTube channel a LinkedIn, a Twitter account, all that stuff. And I'm going to use their profile sections to create a link to the website. So this is the first links I'm going to create. And I'm going to do that like the first week on day one, if I can. The second types of links that I'm going to create are business citations. So I'm going to go to directories in the industry. So if I'm a website reviewing home products, I'll be going to you know, home, home improvement directories and stuff like that, home interior design directories, and putting in the business's name, address, phone number. Now I know most businesses don't all 
have name, address, phone numbers, especially if they're online, but you can fake it. And what you're just doing here is you're, you're getting a baseline of links. You're getting a foundation of links before you actually start link building. So after I've gotten the social profiles and the business citations, I'm gonna move on to guest posting. So guest posting, th these are the actual links that are probably gonna start moving the needle. And the reason I go with guest posts instead of other types of link building is because guest posts happen on brand new pages. Let's say there's a website that I want to link from. Then I pitch them and say, hey, can I write a piece of content for you? It's going to be great and it's going to blah, 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 blah. And so they say, yes, so I write this piece of content that's posted as a new page on their website. And if we look at the natural course of the internet, most new links are created on new pages in, as opposed to old pages of content getting updated with a, a link in it and going to a website. So again, the name of the game is to build trust. So I'm gonna build the types of links that are more common and that's why I'm doing guest posts. And just continue, continue, continue until I jump out of the sandbox. Tassos, is it okay to buy links from authority builders for only three to four months then stop link building altogether? So let's just generalize this question and rephrase it. Is it okay to build backlinks and then just stop? Now I'd probably recommend against this for a few reasons. First is it's just kind of unnatural. Like why would a business that's just putting out good content get a bunch of links and then all of a sudden just stop? Does that mean that the business stopped making good content and people don't care about it anymore? That's not a great signal for Google. And even in the situation, let's say you built a bunch of backlinks and you got to the top positions, you did what you came to do. That's great, but your competitors are never going to stop. They're going to see, hey, who's this guy who came into first place? I'm now number two. What, I'm, what do I need to do? I need to do some SEO and that includes building backlinks. So they're not going to stop. So I wouldn't either. Brock asks, should a site be out of the sandbox before you 301 an expired domain to it? I would say yes, but the main reason for this is because when you're doing 301s, you wanna set up an environment where you can be able to tell whether or not the 301 worked or not. It's not always the case where 301 redirects work every single time, I talked about this before. So if you're taking a domain and you're shifting all that link equity over to your site, that's gonna be your money site, you need to know if this is contributing to it or hurting it. And let's say you have your expired domain, you 301 something to it and nothing happens. Did it not work because this 301 website was bad or did it not work because you're not out of the sandbox yet? You don't know. So you could be living with a toxic parasite 301 into your site the whole time. So eliminate the variables anytime you're doing SEO. Dan says, let's say your budget for a project is gone. The December algo update squash momentum. Do you sit on the site or cut bait and sell for best offer? To be honest, if you just do nothing right now, the likelihood of your website gaining in traffic is very, very slim. Once you stop content and links, kind of like you gave up on the website and the, the factors, the things that you do to increase ranking just stops the likelihood that you'll improve or, or low. That said, I see it happen all the time where people do give up on sites, one update smashes them, they do nothing, and then the next one, they jump up in rankings. It happened to my cousin. The likelihood of that happening is pretty slim and you don't want to bank on that. What I would probably do is if you're over the website, you don't want it anymore, but you do want to liquidate it and then see if it'll sell right now, but it's going to be hard to sell it as well, especially if you just had a big traffic drop. Pop asks, why does my competitor rank higher than me with four backlinks when I have 3,500? Pop, my friend, SEO is very, very multifaceted. It could mean they have better on-site SEO. They, they might be a faster website. They might have optimized the internal links better. They might have optimized their content better. They might have done a hundred different things or a combination of a hundred different things. And maybe you have 3,500 links going to this exact page. They only have four going to that page but they have many, many more links going to the entire website, so their website authority is a lot bigger. So it's very rarely about how many single links do we have going to the URLs that are ranking. It's a very holistic thing going on here. As the big picture, and as we say in the affiliate lab, do all the things, assume it could be anything. And probably the most important question so far, Gail, pineapple on pizza, gross or delicious? Everyone knows this, it's delicious. Make sure to subscribe for more SEO tips and tactics.